نحمد و نسلی علی رسول کریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرخ لی صدری و یسر لی امری واحل العقدتم من لسانی یفقہ قولی وجعل لی وزیر من اہلی اللہم فکہنا فی الدین رب زدنی علما اللہم الہمنا رشتا و عیسنا من شرور انفسنا اللہم ارین الحق حقا و رزقنا اتباعا اللہم ارین الباطل باطلا و رزقنا اجتنابا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ سورة النساء ورس نائنٹی فائف لا يستوي القاعدون من المؤمنين غير أول الضرر والمجاكدون في سبيل الله بأموالهم وأنفسهم فضل الله المجاكدين بأموالهم وأنفسهم على القاعدين درجة وقلا وعد الله الحسنى وفضل الله المجاحدين على القاعدين أجرا عظيما درجات منه ومغفرة ورحمة وقان الله غفورا رحيما We talked about this verse yesterday And in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned the merits and the excellence of jihad, the excellence and the rewards of the mujahidun. And even we talked about the merits of people who help for jihad and who spend and help the mujahidun. Allah says, not equal are those believers remaining at home other than the disabled and the mujahideen who strive and fight in the cause of Allah with their wealth and their lives. Allah has preferred the mujahideen through their wealth and their lives over those who remain behind by degrees. And to both, Allah has promised the best reward. But Allah has preferred the mujahideen over those who remain behind with a greater reward and the greater reward has been promised and explained in the verse 96 as degrees of high position from him and forgiveness and mercy and Allah is ever forgiving and merciful. So the two verses Allah is talking about the preference of the mujahideen as compared to the people who do not who do not do jihad in the path of Allah the second thing which we are going to understand from this verse is about the importance about the ranks and the excellence of the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam This will be so because in the background of the revelation of this verse is an incidence. An incidence in the life of the Prophet ﷺ after which this verse was revealed. Now this verse was revealed after the battle of Uhud. And uh, Prophet ﷺ was sitting in the gathering of his companions that the verse was revealed And as per the normal routine of Prophet ﷺ, he recited the revealed words to the companions around. And there in the gathering was a companion, Hazrat Abdullah bin Umm Maktoum radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was blind and he was also sitting in the gathering. And when he heard the words, He, in fact, could not join the expedition of the Battle of Uhud just because of his blindness. So when he heard that the ranks of those, when he heard that in this verse, Allah has very clearly highlighted that the ranks of those who do jihad and those who stay behind are not the same. And it is the mujahideen who have been promised as a higher reward, a greater reward, higher grades and higher degrees and higher positions and forgiveness and mercy. And he thought that since he is going, he stayed behind, he will be deprived of all that. He got very upset. 
he was so upset because he realized that his his excuse was in fact genuine and that is why he had stayed behind so he immediately raised his hands and he made dua and he made he started supplicating and he was saying that oh allah oh allah reveal your orders keeping inside my disability considering my disability reveal your orders and you know what happened he he said these words three times with full sincerity of the heart three times did he say this that immediately another reveal, revelation came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the second revelation in the same verse the verse 95 these three words were added now if you look at the verse la yastawil qaiduna min al mu'minin the three words ghayru uli dharar they were not present in the first time when this verse was revealed but the second time when this verse was revealed allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if he made an amendment in the words keeping inside the disability and considering keeping in consideration the disability of hazrat abdullah bin umay maktoum radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu and the words mean what the words mean other than the disabled so actually the addition of these words meant a lot it meant that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was now saying what that those believers who go for jihad and those who due to a due to a disabled condition or due to a correct excuse they are being disabled or because of their having appropriate excuse they stay behind these two categories the people who are actually going for jihad and the other people who despite wanting sincerely from the depth of their heart wanting sincerely to go for jihad but they have a genuine excuse they are disabled in some way or the other and they cannot go to jihad so these two groups of the believers are above in ranks in degrees and they will be deserving the mercy and the forgiveness of allah more than those who stay behind without a genuine excuse so this is the merit of excellence of the companions that when they raised hands with full expectation from their merciful allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered their prayers and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considered and took in consideration their excuses and you know what this blind companion of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam hazrat abdullah bin umay maktoum radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu he was the companion regarding whom twice the verses of quran were revealed the second time is in surah abasa where allah said abasa wa tawalla an jaa akhul a'ma what happened here was that it was in the period of makkah that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sitting and there were many leaders of quraish who had come to they were wanting to ask about muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's teachings and the teachings of quran and they wanted to know about the religion of islam and they were sitting around the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he was trying to explain them and trying to convince them <coughs> and he was continuously talking to them so in the meantime when prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was talking to them hazrat abdullah bin umay maktoum passed by and he saw that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was la- was teaching something to these companions and he quickly came running towards the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then he was saying oh messenger of allah teach me also teach me out of what you have been taught and he was repeatedly insisting to be taught what prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was teaching now prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam assuming to assuming him to be a sincere a sincere companion he took him for granted and he like slightly ignored him and then he turned his face and this was all because of the sincere desire of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he wanted to work at the at converting or the conversion of the leaders of Quraysh that will be that would be very helpful for Islam so he slightly ignored 
his companion, which he was like taking him for granted. And because of this behavior of the Prophet Sallallahu not one, not two, not even three, but 16 verses of Surah Abasa were revealed regarding the whole event and the behavior and the attitude of Prophet Sallallahu and they were in favor of Hazrat Abdullah bin Umay Maktoum. So these were the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this is their excellence. They were ignored, they were hurt and the verses were revealed for them. How much do we know about the lives, about the manners, about, about the day-to-day -day life of these companions? How much do we read? How much do we learn about them, try to learn about them? You just go around, go around and ask people who are, who are actively engaged in reading of Quran. That who among, this is a question which I'm telling you, you go and ask the people around you. The question is that who amongst the companions of Prophet Wasallam was the one for whom twice the verses of Quran were revealed. And you would realize that despite the excellence of this companion, he was one of the prestigious companions for whom twice did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrate and reveal his verses. You would see that hardly would people of the literate society, the literate people of the Muslim society, hardly would be like Max, max 5% of the people will be knowing the name. So this is, this is what we need to realize. And we need to realize our ignorance about the lives of these companions. Allah has called them. Allah has called them as رضي الله عنهم ورزو عن. They were those who were pleased with Allah and Allah was pleased with them. They are the people we talk about as an amta alayhim who had been gifted with the bounties of Allah. They were the companions who loved Allah and Allah loved them. These were the people Quran talks about them. Quran recipro reciprocates with them. Quran appreciates them. Allah and Quran supports them. Quran honors them, Quran encourages them, Quran consoles them, Quran mentions them and Quran answers their questions and fulfills their requirements and answers their prayers. These are the companions of Prophet ﷺ. Like there was a female companion, Hazrat Khala bin Tisalba radiallahu ta'ala anha. She comes to the Prophet ﷺ, and she was asking about the condition of zihar her husband has had done. We will be talking about it inshallah in future. So she came about the situation that her husband was said that he's done zihar and he thought the divorce has happened between the two of them. So she was upset that she had small children and she didn't want actually to separate from the husband at this state of her life. So she was continuously like trying to convince the Prophet ﷺ that Allah resolved her issue by revealing the verses of Surah Mujadala. Her voice was heard at the throne of Allah Almighty and verses were revealed to resolve her problem and issues. Hazrat Saad bin Abu Baqas anhu, was sick. Prophet ﷺ came to visit him. And then he was concerned. He was asking about the orders regarding the will and verses of Surah An-Nisa were revealed to answer the questions of Hazrat bin Abi Waqas Another senior, a very sincere companion brought a handful of dates as a jihad fund for the expedition of uh, Tabuk. Before the uh, expedition of Tabuk, Prophet Sallallahu has had asked for monetary help and had asked the people to raise as much funds as they could for the army and for the expedition. So this companion, he brought a handful of dates as the jihad fund. 
and the hypocrites who were sitting in the gathering they started mocking him and they started making fun of him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses of surah tauba and he strongly condemned the behavior of those those hypocrites who was mock, who were mocking at him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that Allah mocks them and Allah makes fun of them then when hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala and had the mother of believers a, a false blame of na'uzu billah of committing immorality was put on her then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be a witness and to declare her chastity and modesty and to save her honor allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he revealed the verses of surah nur and then hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala he himself says that there were three occasions there were three occasions in his life when his suggestion or his desire was revealed in the form of the words of quran that his desires his suggestions became the words of allah and hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala who says that there were three occasions but actually when we go through the history or with the history of the revelations we say that there were more than three like one of them being the first being about maqam ibrahim hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala who used to talk to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he used to say how how good it would be if he would if we would be offering some salah on the place where hazrat ibrahim used to stand and while he was constructing the haram and in surah al-baqarah then the verse was revealed what the khuzu min maqam ibrahim musalla take the place of ibrahim alayhi salam as a place of your salah so what hazrat hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala and who was desirous of and he was suggesting became the words of allah became the words of the quran the second occasion hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu was regarding alcohol when the verse of surah al-baqarah and the verse of surah an-nisa regarding the alcoholic drinks and the intoxicants they were revealed there was there was no clear cut for uh, forbidding of alcohol so despite of these two verses being revealed the people of uh, medina even the companions they did not leave drinking and drinking was like still carrying on they had as i've explained previously they had changed the time of their drinks but it was still carrying on and hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala who was grieved by the situation and he used to pray and he used to ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that oh allah give us a reforming order regarding alcohol that reveal or give us some order regarding alcohol or intoxicants which just actually reforms the society and then the verse number 90 of surah maida was revealed inna al khamru wal maisuru wal ansabu wal azlamu rizqun min amali shaytan fajtanibuhu la allakum tuflihun in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there mentioned that alcohol and gambling and other things which we shall be talking about in surah maida they are prohibited and they are forbidden and then allah in the verses mentioned that will now ask in the uh, in the next verses after the verse number 19 in surah maida that now will o people o believers now would would you refrain and to these verses hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala and who he raised his hands and he would say in the height and in the height and in the height and we would refrain we will refrain and we will refrain so this was the beautiful mutual bond between the companions and between allah they they wished they desired and they prayed for something or they suggested something and allah accepted what they desired allah accepted what they desired or what they suggested and when 
Allah said something and when Allah ordered something, they accepted what Allah ordered. So such a beautiful mutual reciprocal bond between the companions and Allah Azza wa Jal. Then another occasion regarding another issue, Hazrat Umar ta'ala and who used to suggest to the Prophet ﷺ that his wives should cover their faces when they go out, when they leave their houses and they use and they must use the way. But since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had not ordered till then, Prophet ﷺ could not accept the suggestion. But very soon were the verses of Surah Nu revealed, the verse of the wheel, the verse of hijab, wasaluhunna min warai hijab. And the verses of Surah, Hujra, uh, Surah Ahzab and Surah Nur were revealed in which the covering of the face by a veil was made obligatory for the Muslim women. Then another occasion. I tell you, Hazrat Umar ta'ala who has said that there were three occasions. In Bukhari, Hazrat Umar ta'ala has been reported to say that, that there were three occasions. But there are more than three. Like the fourth is after, after the Battle of Badr when um, there were captives and there were the prisoners of wars and since before that there never had been prisoners of wars so Prophet Sallallahu uh, consulted Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu, and Hazrat Umar and who he consulted regarding the handling and the dealing of these prisoners of wars <coughs> as to how should they be dealt with and how should the issue be resolved so since the words of Surah Muhammad had been revealed in which they had been given an option to take ransom or fidya and release these prisoners or the captives, so Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, according to the permission and according to the suggestion of that verse of Surah Muhammad, Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was, who was inclined to be like more soft hearted and who was more uh, like kind and merciful, he, uh, he suggested that they should be um, asked to pay the fidya and the ransom and then they should be released. And the Prophet ﷺ was also very soft-hearted and he was inclined to be obviously more forgiving and being kind. So he accepted what Hazrat um, uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and who suggested. But on the contrary, Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who had a very aggressive suggestion. He said that, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you had over all these uh, prisoners to me. You hand over all these captives to me and I will see to it and I will arrange for it that their own relatives, they behead them and they cut off their heads. So this was like a very aggressive suggestion. The suggestion of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and who was then the Prophet sallallahu decision. But what happened was that after this, after the captives being released, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this decision being implemented, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the words of Surah Al-Anfal. And there Allah condemned the suggestions of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and the decision of the Prophet sallallahu approved of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and whose suggestion. So these were the people these were the people who were the companions, who were the Sahaba Ikram of Prophet ﷺ. And these are the companions we all, we all, as families, we, our children, they need to idolize, glamorize and make them as our role models. People today, the Muslims of today, they would know about they would know about Napoleon, they would know about Hitler, they would know about so many European history, people in the European and in the American history, in the British history. But we are totally unaware and we are totally ignorant and we are totally like illiterate about the knowledge of the lives of the companions of the Prophet we need to learn to all that. We need to learn all that and not only learn, we need to narrate these stories and these events 
to our to all our children i would beg you please please for god's sakes stop narrating the bedtime fables we used to please stop narrating all those all those make believe and false stories the bedtime fables like cinderella and snow white and rapunzel and hansel and gretel which people are the muslims are to their muslim children taking the children to a world a fantasy a fairy world a fantasy world a world totally full of falsehood a world full of totally the disobedience of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we we are narrating these stories to our daughters we as mothers are we've been narrating these stories of these princesses of these beautiful girls who were waiting and then a prince charming came and wedded the lady what are we doing we keep on taking her in a fool's paradise in a fantasy world where she starts believing where she starts developing an image of a prince charming and she starts waiting for a prince charming she waits and she waits for her, the prince charming and then she hunts for the prince charming and then one day she finds the prince charming and she walks in with him and then the parents are upset and then the parents blame her no believe you me it was not her blame believe you me it was not she who was to be blamed it was the mother who put all this nonsensical story in her mind we need to narrate the stories of these companions we make we need to make them as the role models we have so many of these role models as mothers as mothers we have the model of hazrat safia the aunt of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam whose son was hawari rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam hazrat zubair bin awam radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu the mother the mother had trained the mother had taught the mother had brought up the son with such a belief and such a faith that the son became the helper and the supporter of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so as mothers we have the models of hazrat safia hazrat isma bint baqar whose son was hazrat abdullah bin zubair radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu protecting the religion and protecting the haram and protecting the madina and protecting makkah after the death of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we have the role model of hazrat khansa radhiyallahu ta'ala anha who had seven seven sons and all all fighting in the battlefield and the mother reciting poetry to encourage the belief and the faith of their of her sons and encourage them encouraging them to go ahead for martyrdom and then as mothers we have the role model of hazrat ifra radhiyallahu ta'ala anha who who in the first battle of islam who in the first battle of islam in the battle of badr not one not two had five sons she just she just threw off her five sons in the battle field of badr and two of them were martyrs and she became the mother of two martyrs and two two returning with with victory of two mujahideen returning with victory has a safia has a isma has a khansa has a ifra has a ummi amara radhiyallahu ta'ala anha and then and then there are so many has a ummi sulaim radhiyallahu ta'ala anha who presents her son has a tanas radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam service and says Oh Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam accept my son accept my son Hazrat Anas radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu for your service and there Hazrat Anas radhiyallahu ta'ala and who was 10 years he spent in the service of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam oh Allah 
O Allah, let us let us all idolize these mothers. Let us all idolize these mothers. Let us let us let us glamorize them and let us present our sons for the service of Islam, for the preaching, for the propagation, for the protection, for the implementation of Islam. May make us the mothers who could who could raise our sons like as a Safiya radiallahu ta'ala and her did. Hazrat Isma radiallahu ta'ala and her did. Make us make us those mothers who could who could present their sons like Hazrat Khansa, Hazrat Ifra, Hazrat Umm Amara and Hazrat Hazrat Umm Sulaim radiallahu ta'ala and her. And oh Allah, oh Allah, the sons we present to you. O oh Allah, the sons we present to you, the grandsons we present to you. Allah, take charge of them. Allah, take hold of them. Allah, take charge of them, take hold of them, accept them in your path. Allah, define them, Allah, refine them, Allah, develop them. Allah, make them the mujahideen of Islam. Allah, make them and raise them as muhafizeen of Islam. Allah make them as hafizine Quran, hafizine Hadith. Allah make them and raise them as preachers of Quran, as teachers of Quran, as scholars of Hadith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept them all from us. We need to teach them. We need to teach them and we need to inform them. The models, the models of Muslim women as as daughters, as daughters, we have the model of Hazrat Fatima radiallahu ta'ala and her. And as wives, as wives, we have the models of Hazrat Khadija al Qubra radiallahu ta'ala and her, who was, who was promised, who was sent salam by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She came, she came over to the Prophet sallallahu and Hazrat Jibreel, he had came down and he said, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hazrat Khadija would be just coming, convey or pass on the salam of Allah and salam of Hazrat Jibreel to Hazrat Khadija al Qubra. She was promised, she was promised as a palace in Jannah which would be carved out of white pearls. We have as wives the role model of Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and her. We have as wives the role model of Hazrat Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala and her and in fact all the mothers of the believers. We have the role model of Umm Ayyub Ansari radiallahu ta'ala and her who was the hostess along with her husband to the Prophet sallallahu immediately after his migration. We have the role model of Umm Sulaim radiallahu ta'ala and her whose story in I narrated in the beginning of Surah Al-Nisa that she married her husband for for the bride's money was what? The bride's gift was what? Remember? It was the conversion, the acceptance and embracing of Islam by the husband which was her bride's gift. And then we have the role models of like Umm Darda and Umm Dahda who were the supporters who were the helpers of their of their husbands when they were spending in the path of Allah? Oh Allah, let us remember, let us learn, and let us take pride in all these all these companions we are the descendants of. Remember, if we as mothers narrate these stories to our children, this will make them be proud to be a Muslim. The history of Islam, if we taught and if we teach all the history of Islam to our children, they will be, they will be, inshallah, proud to be the descendants of such, such excellent ancestors. There will be no complex to be a Muslim. There will be no regrets to be in Islam. But of course, only those mothers will be able to narrate and recite who themselves know of all these events who read, who listen, and who remember. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Allah, make us one of them. Worse, 
Indeed, those whom the angels take in death while they were wronging themselves, that is, they were in a sinful life, they were committing sins in their lives and it was their death time. So there Allah in this verse is mentioning now a conversation which is going on between a person who was spending a sinful life, a life of disobedience and when the death angel came there was a conversation. The angels will say, in what condition were you? They will say, we were oppressed in the land. So before I read with the whole of the translation of the verse, these were the people who were living in a non-Muslim state and there they were oppressed or there they could not live according to the teachings of Islam and there they were forced to or they were willfully by choice or by option, they were spending a sinful life. So the angels will ask, in what condition were you? They will say, we were oppressed in the land. The angels will say, was not the earth of Allah spacious enough for you to immigrate therein? For those, their refuge is hell and evil it is as a destination. For whom the refuge is hell? The persons who willfully, the people who willfully lived in a place where they were oppressed because of being Muslims and they did not immigrate to another land or a country or a place where they could spend their life, their lives according to the obedience of Allah. And then in verse 98, Allah says, except for all those people who did not immigrate Allah has promised the destination of hell except for the oppressed among men and women and children who could not who could not devise a plan nor are they directed to a way that is they had a genuine excuse and they did not find the monetary or the physical resources to be able to emigrate. They have been warded off the punishment which is mentioned for those who did not have any excuse and they preferred staying on in the same place. <coughs> and they preferred to stay on in that place and intentionally did not or out of the worldly love, out of the world of love of their homes or their prosperous business in that area or their houses in that area or their jobs, very successful jobs in that area. Out of all these worldly reasons, they did not immigrate to save their religion or their faith. Then they have been promised as the evil destination, but exemption has been given to those who could not find the resources and conditions. And then in verse 99, Allah says, for those it is expected, for whom? Who did not have the condition and resources to emigrate. For those it is expected that Allah will pardon them and Allah is ever pardoning and forgiving. <coughs> so here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to do what? In this verse, Allah is trying to encourage people to immigrate, to save their religion and to save their belief and faith and to escape the sinful form of life. In verse number 100, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to promise the reward, the reward of a person who immigrates for this cause. Allah says, وَمَنْ يُحَاجِرْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ يَجِدْ فِي الْأَرْزِ مُرَاعَمًا قَسِيرًا قَسِيرًا وَسَعَةً And whoever immigrates for the cause of Allah will find on the earth many alternative locations and abundance. And whoever leaves his home as an immigrant to Allah and his messenger, then death overtakes him. His reward has already become incumbent upon Allah and Allah is ever forgiving and merciful. Merciful and forgiving for whom? Who emigrates for the cause of Allah. So now 
in the wars from 97 to 99. Wars 97, 98, 99. Allah is talking in this verse, is actually mentioning a conversation of people who were living in a non-Islamic state where they were either oppressed or they could not easily live according to the teachings of Quran. That is, they could not practice the orders of Allah. And so it is being suggested that it would have been better for their hair and hereafter. What Allah is suggesting is that it would have been no doubt, it would have been better for their hair and hereafter if they had immigrated to a land where they could easily live according to the orders and the limits of Quran. So Allah is encouraging people to do hijrat or to immigrate. The root word of hijrat is hajim ra and it means to leave, to abandon or to migrate or immigrate. Immigration can be permanent or it can be temporary. And then it can be in different forms and different uh, measures can be taken to immigrate. Like the immigration of the Prophet ﷺ was a permanent geographical, Prophet ﷺ and his companions obviously with him was a permanent and a geographical immigration from Mecca to Medina. And the purpose was just to save all of them from the oppressions of the people in Mecca and to save their faith and belief and to live life according to the teachings of Allah in the Islamic state of Medina. So a person who is geographically migrating or geographically immigrating can be because of different reasons, you know. They're shifting from one area to another, from one country to the other, from one state to the other, can be for various purposes. Like Muslim, they were living in a non-Islamic state and there the conditions prevailing in the society were that they could not live according to Islamic code of life or they could not spend their life according to the Islamic mode of ethics. For example, they could not earn halal. They could not, they could not stop from the forbidden things. Halal food was not available and their children were exposed to the society in so many evils they was, the children were being exposed to. Thus, they immigrated just to save their faith or to be steadfast on the right path. So this will be what? A permanent geographical immigration. To spend life according to the commandments of Allah and the teachings of Hadith and Sunnah, this geographical immigration is no doubt. Hijrat fil arz, hijrat fil arz, the geographical or the migration in the land is no doubt the highest rank of excellence. It will have the best rewards. There is no doubt, absolutely no doubt. Similarly, a person can migrate to save oneself and his family from the persecutions or the oppressions of the anti-Muslim forces in the area. In the fear that all this oppression or the persecutions may cause them, cause a loss of faith or they may just slip into the sinful life. So these might be just one of the few reasons why a person may immigrate in the land of Allah and this will be a geographical, permanent geographical immigration. The second form may be a temporary, a temporary immigration in the land. This temporary immigration can be for different purposes, like for seeking knowledge of Quran and Hadith. Person might just travel long distances or short distances to, to seek the knowledge of Quran and Hadith or traveling for preaching, for teaching, or to spread the words of Allah and Prophet Sallallahu or travel or to make journey to protect the teachings of Islam, 
are then to travel or to go around and to move about for the implementation of Islam. And obviously, another form of traveling would be, another form of a temporary immigration in the land would be to do jihad in the path of Allah. A mujahid also has to temporarily immigrate. So all these can be temporary and inshallah by Allah Azza wa Jal, they also will be rewarded. But no doubt, the permanent immigration holds the ranks of excellence as far as the reward is, con reward is concerned. But there is more to immigration, you know. Other than shifting geographically and on the land, there can be certain bondsmen who can be doing Hijrat fi sabilillah. As I again repeat the meaning of the word that hijrat or immigration means what? To leave, to abandon, to forego or to give up. So if a person was involved, like I give you a few examples of other forms of immigrants now. There was a person. He was involved in like a life of showbiz with music and dancing and videos and movies all forbidden things or then a person had a business of or an industry of alcohol or intoxicants like preparing alcohol or extracting alcohol or selling alcohol or carrying alcohol transporting alcohol these are all deeds which prophet Islam has has been cursed upon so he had any of these businesses and when he read through the message of the Quran, he realized how strictly all these forms of businesses or dealings, how strictly they were forbidden in Quran. And then because of the fear of Allah, the person repents and then decides to abandon his unlawful source of earning and to try and work out and find out some lawful means of earning. Now, you know what? His leaving, his giving up, his unlawful business is a form of economic migration for the sake of Allah. This is a form of economic immigration of that person for the sake of Allah. For the fear of Allah, for seeking the player of Allah, has he shifted his business? So this is an economic immigration of the person. Then there is a woman who used to wear vulgar, revealing, transparent dresses and used to feel very happy and very proud wearing all those forbidden dresses. But then she read the verses of Surah Noor and Surah Ahzab and she got aware of the Islamic dress code. And she realized how much strictly her previous dress code was, was against the commandments of Allah and how strictly would she be deprived of being ple the player of Allah and then realizing all that, how strictly forbidden it was for the Muslim women to wear all this, she decides to leave, to give up the style of her previous style of her dressing and she opts or adopts the Islamic dress code taught and brought by the Messenger of Allah. She is in fact what? She is in fact also in a state of immigration. A personal a migration of her behavior, uh, immigration a social, a behavioral immigration towards Allah. And this is exactly how it is. She will be, she will be, inshallah, but Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah the kind, will be granted as an immigrant in the path of Allah. Then there is a person, a woman like, who has a loose tongue. 
was in the habit of making fun of people, mocking people, calling friends with bad names, using abusive language, backbiting, slandering, all sorts of evil conversations. And she read the verses of Surah Hujurat and she realized, she just realized that she didn't know what major sins she had been committing. She just realizes how major sins she had been committing and she confesses and she repents. She seeks forgiveness and then decides and promises to give up all these bad manners and immoral conversations. She decides and promises with herself and even with Allah and asks for his help. She decides to check and control her tongue, to harness her tongue to guard her manners and she decides to leave all her previous manners. In fact, she is doing what? She is immigrating in her morals, in her ethics and this inshallah will also be rewarded. She will be rewarded of her repentance. She will be rewarded for seeking forgiveness. She will be rewarded to leave or abandon the disobedience and adopt the obedience and she will be, her name will be listed and recorded in the names of those who emigrated in the path of Allah. Allahumma ja'alna minhum, O oh Allah, make us one of those who migrate for the sake of Allah. Make us one of those who migrate for the sake of seeking the knowledge of Quran and Hadith. Make us one of those who migrate, who migrate for the cause of preaching and teaching of Quran and spreading the words of Hadith. Make us one of those who quit the evil and the sinful mode of life. Allah, help us all, help us all leave, quit abandon and give up the sinful mode of life. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabina wa ja'alni min al-mutatakhireen. Rabbi ghfir wa raham wa anta khayru raqimeen. Allahumma inna ka afudhan kareemun tuhibbu al-affa fa'fu anna fa'fu anna fa'fu anna Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika Allahumma ghfir li Allahumma ghfir li, Allahumma ghfir li, Allahumma ghfir lana, warhamna, Allahumma ghfir la, maghfir lana, warhamna, wahtana, dhaafina, warzutna. Rabbana, zolamna anfusana. Allah, we've wronged ourselves. Oh Allah, we've wronged ourselves. Rabbana zolamna anfusana wa illam taghfir lana and if you don't forgive us O oh merciful, O oh the kind, O oh the forgiver of all sins if you don't forgive us wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna and you have mercy on us wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min al khasireen there's absolutely no doubt that we will be among the losers we will be among those who are the losers on the day of resurrection. Allahumma la taja'alla minum. Wallah, may we be not among those. Verse 101. Wa iza in khayftum an yaftinakum allazina qafaru inna alqafirina qanu lakum aduwum mubina and when you travel throughout the land there is no blame upon you for shortening the prayers especially if you fear that those who disbelieve may disrupt or attack you indeed the disbelievers are ever to you a clear enemy. So now in this verse 101, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is here suggesting, suggesting, uh, suggesting 
and giving the permission of shortening of salah that is kasr salah now if i relate this with the previous verses from verse number 97 to 100 because you know there is always a link between all the verses and all the chapters and all the surahs of quran it is not just a random verse which is not co- connected with the previous or which is not connected with the verse coming afterwards there is a continuous link in the message of allah in the words of allah so remember that each verse is linked with the verse before and after each chapter is linked and connected with the chapter before and after and each sura with all its messages and orders and commandments is connected is linked is related has a continuous conversation with the previous surah and with the surah coming afterwards so now if i link it with the previous four verses in the previous verses allah has talked about and encouraged and talked about the reward which is promised to the people who are doing hijrat fi sabilillah or who are immigrating in the path of allah for the cause of allah now it is very understandable that when a believer is shifting in the land may it be temporary or may it be permanent then obviously he will have to travel he will have to travel so what will be the format and what will be the pattern of salah while the person is traveling while a believer is traveling has been now explained here in this verse 101 in this verse allah is giving the permission and the option of shortening of salah in this verse of quran and the words of hadith and the manners of sunna will elaborate on this permission of quran as prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that permission of shortening of salah is a gift of allah i repeat permission of the shortening of salah is a gift of allah so avail of it that is accept it and adopt it It is bad taste refusing a gift isn't it if somebody offers us and gives us a gift and we refuse to accept it it would be bad manner it would be a bad taste and it would be against the social ethics so this is a gift of allah and we need to accept this that is we need to avail of this and there are people who say that i have all the time while traveling and i i need not shorten i need not to shorten my prayers but this these words of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam are very clearly asking us to shorten our prayers or salah during travel <coughs> now here um, i would want to discuss about the shortening of prayers the certain um, issues and questions which are in the minds of people the first being that how long a travel <coughs> the first question would be that how long a travel and what distance and what time period should be specified beyond which shortening of salah can be opted now there are different opinions of different scholars about this there are scholars who specify as regarding the distance and there are certain scholars who specify regarding the time so there <coughs> so there are scholars who say that shortening of salah will be when the travel is for the duration of more than the duration of one day and a night and then others think that it is just the travel of one day and then there are others who say that they is it is it has to be done only 
and the option is um, for only those who travel for a time or a distance of what three days and three nights so they are variable opinions and then there are going to be opinions related with the miles or with the distance certain say it is a distance of 48 miles then there are other who talk about 72 miles so they were your opinions you know but all these different opinions are basically and practically not applicable today or in the period or days of today because the means of transport and the variety of vehicles of today for example you see if a person is traveling by foot and another person is riding a horse or is in a mule cart and then there is a person in a car or a person who is traveling in an electric train or then there is a person in traveling in a in a luxury liner or then there is a person who is traveling in a jumbo jet how can we quantify and specify in form of the time and the distance now they would all be traveling at a different speed so we cannot quantify and specify in the form of the distance or the time. So for practical purposes, for the sake of convenience, the opinion of the scholars for the, for the time of today is that any person who belongs to an urban population that is living in the city or a town, when he travels and he moves out of the suburbs of the city then actually he is in a state of journey and travel and he can avail of this option a person who is a villager when a rural dweller he moves out of the outskirts of the village then he will be he will be allowed or permitted to shorten his salah so the urban people going out of the suburbs of the city and the rural dwellers moving out of the outskirts of the village even will be allowed or permitted to shorten their salah. Now, for how long a stay? How long if the person wants to stay, can he avail of this option or permission? For this again, there were different opinions and I would be here just I'll just be talking about the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa, Rahmatullah, that is in the Hanafi school of thought. If a person, if a traveler has intention of staying for 15 or less than 15 days, that his intention was that he wants to stay for 15 or less than 15 days, then from starting from the day one, he will be permitted to shorten his salah. But if right from the beginning he intended to stay for more than 15 days, then from day one he will be offering his complete salah and there's no permission for him to shorten his salah. Now shortening of the salah, the next issue what we need to understand is about the salah itself. Now we need to understand and remember clearly that the shortening of Salah is only and only permitted for the obligatory Salah, that is for the first Rakat. The obligatory Salah, that is the first, first Rakat, will only be cut down. And these obligatory or the first Rakat will be cut down and they will be halved but it will be mandatory that they will not be offered while riding or while in a vehicle <coughs> and the person will try as far as possible to get off his ride or to come out of the vehicle and offer these obligatory or fard rakat on the ground. Now, as far as the sunnah salah is concerned, they, they are permitted. It is permitted that during our journey or during the travel, 
which come up to the upper mark, which we've discussed already, the person can just leave all the sunnah. All the sunnah might just be left off. But if the person desires to pray the sunnah salah, then the person will have to complete all the rakat and there will be no cutting off. But he is permitted and he can offer these sunnah salah on the vehicle or on the animal, etc., whichever the person is riding on. So the shortening or the cutting off is only on the first salah. So now if I wind up that how can we cut off and what will be the minimum salah which we can offer during the travel is for Fajr, there will be, we. it is obligatory to offer the two Farah and the two Sunnah. The two Sunnah of Fajr, the Prophet Wasallam said that they, they were dear to the Prophet Wasallam that everything in the world, the more than everything in the world, these two Sunnah were dear to the Prophet Wasallam, And he did not quit and he did not leave these two Sunnah even while traveling or even when the Salah was Qaza. That is, it was ordered, it was offered after the time passed. Even then, Prophet ﷺ never left or never omitted the Salah, the two Sunnahs of Fajr. So in the shortened prayer for Fajr, we will be offering the two Fars and the two Sunnah. For the Zuhar prayers, the four Fars will be cut down to two and the Sunnah might just all be left over or they may be completely offered and the two Fars will be completely offered. Then in Asr, the four Fars Rakat would be shortened and cut down to two and the matter of the Sunnah will be the same as I have previously explained. For Maghrib, the three Faraz Rakat obviously cannot be cut off to half, so they will stay as three, and the issue of the Sunnah will be as we've talked. In the Isha, the four Fars will be shortened to two, and the Sunnahs will be as we've talked. Now, regarding the Vitr of Isha prayers, there are again different opinions of the Imams. Imam Abu Hanifa in the Hanafi school of thought, the Vitr of the Isha prayers are obligatory. Imam Abu Hanifa considers as the Vitr as obligatory, so he is of the opinion that they have to be offered in the shortened salah during travel also and they cannot be omitted so three vitr will be offered according to the Hanafi school of thought in the Isha prayers despite the salah being shortened but according to Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, Imam Malik and Imam Shafi'i, the three other schools of thought, they consider the vitr as not as obligatory and for us, they consider it as a sunnah. So according to these three schools of thought, the vitr can be left over or quitted in the shortened salah during traveling. So these are the opinions we can avail of any one of the schools of thought we may want to be. Then there is another opinion and other aspect of this shortening of prayer we need to understand is that according to Hadith and Sunnah, it is permitted. It is permitted to collect, collect two prayers at one time. It is permitted to offer two prayers together at any of the time of both of these prayers. And these two prayers, which can be collectively offered, are number one, the first pair being Zuhr and Asr, and the second prayer, uh, pair being Maghrib and Isha. So Zuhr or Asr or Maghrib or Isha, they can be collectively offered. Either they can be preponed, 
that is zuhr and asr they can be collectively offered preponing both that is they can be both collectively offered at the starting time of zuhr prayers or they can be postponed they can be postponed till the last time of asr and both be offered till the last time of asr remember collecting or offering together of these pairs of salah is not permissible in our daily normal day to day life when we are moving about from morning till evening in our own city we might be traveling like more than 48 hours within our city within our towns but we have not gone out of the suburbs the limits of the suburbs then we are not permitted to shorten the salah and we are not permitted to collect the salah of two timings as appear and offer them at one single time similarly isha and maghrib can be preponed and they can be postponed so because of collectively offering the salah which is known as jama bainu salatain the collectively offering of two pairs of salah we or all the travelers get a very prolonged salah free time that is from the start the starting time of zuhr to the last or the ending time of isha there is a long period where we can keep on continuously traveling and traveling and traveling and we do not have to offer salah so this option and this permission will give a traveler a totally namaz and a salah free period from the first time of ish uh, first time of zuhr to the last time of isha now availing of this option and permission if despite availing of this permission a person cannot find conditions that he gets off the vehicle of the train and offers the obligatory or the first salah on the ground like if the person is is traveling by air and long transatlantic flights or the lengthy trans pacific flights for about like 24 hours or 18 hours non stop the person just can't come down on the ground and offer the salah then under these situations prevailing the person is permitted to offer the salah on the vehicle in which the person is traveling otherwise there should be a maximum effort of coming down on the ground because this is proven by the manners of sunnah reported in bukhari that he was traveling he was riding a camel and when there was a the time of salah he got down from the camel and he offered his first rakat on the ground so this is proven by the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but is permitted if the person despite making all the efforts cannot just get down on the ground there only will it be permitted to offer the first rakat on the vehicle so this is the option of the shortening of prayers and inshallah tomorrow we shall be talking about the verse number 1 102 where allah will be talking about the salah during the fair in a condition of fair and tomorrow inshallah i will be talking about the merits and excellence of salah and the importance of salah in the life here and here after what the person offering salah regularly throughout his life is going to be rewarded with and what will be the advantages of a person who is a regular of who regularly offers the salah is going to is going to be a source of immense training and uh, opening the path of jannah easily to the person who is offering salah we will be talking about the merits of salah and we shall be talking about the congregational salah and its importance and its merits and then inshallah we will be talking about the different timings of salah how were they taught to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and what are the time limits i would against urge i will urge and request all of you to uh, share all this and to invite others towards the programs 
Inshallah, we are towards now our winding sessions and coming to the worst 102, Inshallah. I suppose like in a five or six sessions, we shall be winding up these sessions of the deep insight of Surat Al-Nisa. So with a very few days in hand, I would request you to help us spread the words of Quran and the teachings of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Fi amanillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Rabbana la tuzih qulubana ba'da is khadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma innaka antul wahab. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Amin summa amin.